thank you all for traveling to come here today to the conference, uh, Connect, Learn and Share. And let's hope that you can do all three. Before I introduce my colleagues on the podium beside me, I just want to get some housekeeping uh, out of the way. Just the statutory notice that that's a fire exit there, another fire exit behind you, and if there is a fire alarm, please don't run this way. You just follow me, I'll be over there. Uh, the other piece of housekeeping I'd like to get over is, if anybody is uh, following the sign language interpreter, just make sure that, you're, that you have clean sight. If not, now is the time to move. Uh, anybody who's following the captioning, the speed text, please again make sure that you can follow. And I just want to do a, a communications check to make sure that everybody can hear what's going on because it's your day and there's no point in missing any part of it. So it's difficult to hear you here. Yes. Very difficult to hear you down here. Okay. No, I need to move in closer to the mic. Now if I speak this way, yeah. it's a little bit better. Yeah. I hate these things. So I have a, a fly mic. Okay, that's good. Those who are using the crash, I think it just to set you at rest, there are 24 children in the crash. We're well used to looking after children. Our staff are really experienced at that, and there are professional uh, child minders there as well. But if anything does happen, if a child doesn't settle, we will, I do promise you, we will contact you. The parent will be notified, so you can relax and enjoy the morning and afternoon. Okay, now on to the people at the table. This is Dina Beams, and I'll talk more about her in a short while. Sorry, Dina Beams. Oops. Gwen Carr and Ashling Heffernan. As we're beginning to speak about them, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information. Just to say that the purpose of the, today's meeting is to provide sort of a learn, share, and connect opportunity for parents of young deaf children. Most of the, in fact, all of you, them are between zero and 12 years of age. So from that point of view, it's an opportunity of you, for you to, to make the most of this. We decided at a, a late stage not to have professionals in the workshops because I think a, a direct parent-to-parent -parent contact is much, much better for you. So I hope you'll enjoy the, work the workshop format. The reason we chose round tables was because it's easier for people to talk to each other and also it adds that little air of informality to the day. We're privileged to have such talent, international talent here, to share their expertise and experience with us. And uh, Gwen and Dina are serious world-class professionals in the er er area of early child development for deaf and hard of hearing children. They've traveled a long way to get here. So, you know, we're delighted and proud to have them. This is, the, this is the lost phone. Does anybody recognize it? Somebody left a phone outside. Well, I dare not answer. <laughs> but if anybody who is short of a phone covered in a nice red packet, please approach me before I go home. Can I just hold you for one second? Now just to explain a little bit of the format of the day. The first session is going to be here, so we're all in a disciplinary session. After that, we're breaking out into two workshops. One workshop will be here. So those of you at the front four tables stay. Those of you at the back four tables, if you could move into the room just behind us, there's a similar setup to here where, and people don't have to worry about missing something because the workshop in the morning will be replicated in the afternoon so everybody gets a chance for everything. In the afternoon, Ter Terry Risanson is going to speak. Terry, if you could just identify yourself. Terry, again, is a mother of deaf children and now a grandmother and uh, ha is extremely experienced in our area so she's <coughs> going to do a session on taking care of yourself because as focal people in the development of your child 
your health, your emotional well-being and the well-being of the family is, is important. So it's not all about education and other things. It's also about yourselves as a family. So with that in mind, I'll just give you the last thing. You see a conference clinic. The idea of that is instead of having a lengthy question and answer session where sometimes you get the same questions again, that you have an opportunity to, each of the speakers has agreed to have a, an informal clinic, which is basically a time for you to go and ask personal questions or things that you want to catch up on uh, in a more informal uh, atmosphere. So everybody's clear on that? Grant. I'll just give a brief introduction then to Gwen Carr, who's going to lead off. Gwen is the Deputy Director <laughs> of the England National Health Service Newborn Hearing Screening Programme. And she's an honorary senior research associate at the University College London Ear Institute. Uh, she co-led their government study on informed choice, families and deaf children in the UK. And that led to the production of national guidance for professionals and a handbook, very comprehensive handbook for parents. Uh, apart from that, Gwen is actually one of the few speakers of Anglo-Saxon in the country, which is an ancient language in Britain. And I understand that she's an excellent cross-stitcher for anybody who's interested in that end of things. So with that, I will introduce you to Gwen Carpenter. Can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Back. Oh, okay. I don't know you'll hear me, but what do you think? Oh, mind you, it will prove I'm still alive, so that's probably quite good. Is that better? Yeah? Okay. First of all, thank you very much indeed to Niall and his team for asking me. Um, I've been across to Ireland a lot of times in the last couple of years, mainly working with audiologists and um, the teachers of the deaf. And most of my work now is going around developing good, comprehensive systems to support families um, through the screening programme and then post the diagnosis and on into early intervention. And before I did this, I did once have a proper job. Um, I was a paediatric audiologist in an early years uh, teacher of the deaf. And then I also had four years in um, the UK with the National Deaf Children's Society. And I always tell people I learned more about working with families in those four years than I did in the previous 25 as a service provider. So, um, you know, I'm here today as well to learn, to learn from you. So to kick off, I thought, I think this is a great title for a conference, Connect, Learn and Share. And of course today it's an opportunity for you as parents to connect and learn from each other um, and share your experience. And of course, we are connecting um, and sharing with you, but we're also learning from you. And I think one of the things we need to capture in our systems as we develop them, uh, particularly in response to newborn screening, but right through the system, right through education and health and the, the social care, is connecting, learning and sharing should become a desired way of working for families and professionals together. And um, when I'm talking to professionals, I often say, no family sets out to be that family from hell, which every professional will say they've had one, and they glibly say it, but no family sets out to be that. But equally, no professional sets out to do a bad job. Everybody goes into whatever profession they go into because they believe they can make a difference by bringing their skills. But often something along the way, something goes wrong. And it's usually because that connection and, and mutual sharing doesn't happen. So in my view, it's all about teamwork. And that is very much the theme that I'm going to start off and Dinah will continue <coughs> and, ex and explore very much from a family perspective. But I want to just start with the thought of what makes a good team and what are the characteristics of a good team. Because professionals actually feel they are a team. Um, and families say it doesn't feel like it. Or if it is a team, and if it's a football team, we're the football, not a good member of the team. So let's just have a look. Um, this is the winning team from the wheelchair basketball at the Olympics. 
What strikes you about this team that helped it to win? Common goals, they're linked together. They're obviously getting their ethos right, ready to start. So first of all, they feel like a team. They're connected well to each other. Do you recognize this team? <laughs> this photograph to me gives another component of a good team. It's leadership. Everybody's huddled around, everybody wants to get that instruction from the leader, and they're, they're in it together. So there's all this, this contact, there's closeness, and they've got somebody in the middle who's driving them on. So they've got good leadership. What about this team? Now, a cycling team works in a very different way. So there are individuals in there. There's only going to be one individual winner. But the team is absolutely crucial to get him to the front. And for that team to work well, some people have to sacrifice what they want as individuals for the greater good of the team. And I often say this to professionals where they all want to be the saviour of the family. You know what? Nobody needs saving. They need supporting, not rescuing. But secondly, you might not be what they need. Whether you want to be at the front or not, you might not be what they need. And there might be times when you step back and somebody else is what they need. So I think, again, this, we need to have a selflessness in, in teams to support <coughs> families well. And this is the team I like the best and I think has an, an analogy for, for what we do together, professionals and parents. And it's really playing like an orchestra, where you could envisage the parents, the family, being the conductor. Only you know the piece of music that you want everybody to play in harmony. And the professionals are like the individual players. So there might be some, you know, you have a few violinists, um, there'll be a guy at the back on the cymbals, <coughs> We don't need him all the time. If he started playing his cymbals constantly, it would spoil the music. But his time will come and he will be necessary. So quite often I'll say to different professional groups, in this piece of music, you might be the cymbalist. You've got something to offer, but it isn't all the time. So I think what we're looking for overall is a harmony in the team. And parents are crucial to that team. And this, of course, is what we're after ultimately. A really good, natural experience that, that feels good. And um, a lot of the work I've done um, across the UK has been inspecting paediatric services. And quite often, um, when you do that, we've got all these different quality markers and we're ticking boxes, and they can have all the right components. But if it doesn't feel good, to you, if it doesn't feel like a quality service, if it doesn't meet your needs, then it isn't a quality service. Because quality is all about perception at the point of delivery. And I'm sure you can all think of some great service. Well, I hope you can all think of some great service that you've had. But I'm sure you can think of lots of things that if you'd have been the conductor, you'd have had them play differently. So I want you to look at this. This is you or a semblance of you, happy family. And these are the people coming around you into your team when you have a diagnosis of, of deafness in your family. Now I should say that these are National Deaf Children Society graphics and when I asked for them to be done, um, all I said was I want pictures, because it was for a publication. I said I want pictures of all these different professionals please. And nobody said to me, well what should they look like? So I said, oh, just do what you think, do what you think, make it look good. So you will see some stereotypes coming here, and these are for people who've probably never met these groups. So the GPs often, obviously, thought about as being trustworthy, kindly. And then we have the paediatrician, stereotype, female, very nice looking, slightly batty looking, <laughs> very important looking, an MT consultant, cochlear implant team, Always look young and attractive. Health visitor, very motherly. I noticed, um, you know, you mentioned being grandmothers. 
Um, Dan, Diana and I are also grandmothers. Ashley obviously isn't. Um, but we don't like to admit it because we still think ourselves in that uh, young slot. Speech and language therapist, always blonde, always pretty. <laughs> Ophthalmologist, teacher of the deaf, deaf role model, and if anybody's met a social worker, that's obviously what. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you have all these people in your lives, all purporting to be your need. And one of the things we found when we were inspecting, um, sorry, I shouldn't use inspecting, when we were reviewing teams, multidisciplinary teams, in England when we were implementing newborn screening, was we said, we'd like to meet with your team. And some authorities, local authorities, were coming together, and they clearly did know each other. They'd worked together, but some people knew each other better than others. But we also went to some places where they were saying, oh, this is my very close colleague, Mrs. Um, having a quick look on the batch. They'd obviously never met each other at all. So they might have thought they were a team, but they weren't. And if your child has additional needs, you may have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, you know, other professionals that constitute this huge team around you. But many of these people have never played together in a team before, apart from their own teams. So it's a, it's a different ethos for them. So if we look at what makes a good team, what are the characteristics of a good team? We have trust, mutual trust, empathy, accommodation, which means understanding different people's views and perhaps changing the way you work to accommodate other people's views, and a joint mission. And the mission is actually to provide the best possible services that <coughs> they can, that feel good, that feel right to a family. And that's often where it goes wrong, because we don't always ask the families what, we want, what they want it to feel like. And I think we need to put families in a more central position. And families often say, I want a seamless service. And they say the most positive factor in their experience, especially when there are lots of different professionals, you know, they want seamless service. But what do we actually mean when we say we want a seamless service? So I put this to you. These are, regardless of the two guys, I was going to say something disparaging now, but I won't. <laughs> um, these are the only seamless garments I know of, ponchos. They don't look good, they don't fit, um, they don't, they're not the right shape, they're, they're a mess really, aren't they? But they are seamless. Is that not what you asked for? Or I'd like to put to you that this is really what we're after. <laughs> well seen. There are plenty seams in that well-fitting suit. You just can't see them. And so I think the challenge for us when we want our professionals to work together is for them to be well-seamed. We want to experience a seamless um, provision, but we don't want to see all the seams and the fighting for position and the duplication of services. So that's what we're after. And the NDCS commissioned um, a piece of research from the University of Manchester um, about working with parents. And all the parents who were in this research actually had a deaf child with an additional need. So they were working with even bigger teams of professionals inputting to them. And this is what one of the parents said, and I won't read it out because some, um, can, you, can you see it at the back? Is it readable from the back? So I won't read it out. And I will give you a moment just to look. <coughs> okay. Does that resonate with anybody here? Can you say you've had an, an experience where communication between the teams is, is not as good as it should be? One parent recently said to me, she said, I've got this one coming and this one coming. And um, I don't know what to do, really, because they're both doing the same thing. Um, but they seem to need to talk. So I give them a cup of tea, and I'm there with them. And I thought, mm -hmm, who's supporting who here? It was, the, you know, the families were feeling they were supporting all these professionals who all wanted to be terribly useful, uh, but were doing the same thing. So I think that is a challenge for professionals. 
and they don't know what it feels like to have multiple uncoordinated inputs. And unless parents drive that and tell them, then they're not going to change. So why is teamwork an issue then? Well, we do know from all sorts of different research that when it coordinates well, it's a more positive experience for families. You don't need research to tell you that actually, it's, it's logic. But there's also a belief that's being backed up by research that it leads to better outcomes. Better outcomes for families and better outcomes for the, for the children themselves. So this is the challenge, I think, that we hope to learn as we share with you today through the workshops and listening to each other of how to change. I will read this one out. So um, it comes from A.A. Milne. Um, I don't have copyright clearance for this, so do be careful. <laughs> um, here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And I think what the introduction of newborn screening has done, although obviously, unless you're planning another and um, your children are past that point, but I think what it's doing is, a cat is providing a catalyst a driver for services to look at the way they work and that doesn't just benefit the children who are going to come along in the future, it benefits all the children in the system now or potentially benefits us all if the change is positive. So I think the challenge now, and never has the time been better for parents to actually drive services and really help set the agenda, um, for people to work together and think about how they might do it differently. So, two questions, and I think this is something that Diane is going to pick up and explore in a little bit more depth in the context of going back to the orchestra with parents as in charge, parents as the central driver. She's going to talk a little bit more about how parents can be pivotal team members in their own families and in the system's development. So I'm going to leave with these two questions. So in the Ireland context, <coughs> How can parents you know, build on the conference here to connect, learn and share alongside professionals to do the best for deaf children so that you know, we get the right harmony that comes out of the orchestra? And how can we work together, parents work together, so that the experience is one of integrated, sensitive, culturally sensitive and well-seen support? And if we can crack that question, we'll have cracked a very big issue because people have been trying to do this for a very long time. And as I said at the outset, nobody thinks we'll all get together and we'll make a mess of this. We all think we're doing the right thing for the right reasons. But somehow the ingredients in the cake don't turn out the way we want to look. And that's one of the reasons when um, Niall introduced me. He didn't say that I actually can't bake at all. But hopefully I can embroider well into something that looks like a cohesive picture. So on that note, I'll pass on to Dinah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gwen, and let's hope we can address some of those, que those two questions during the day. Can I just introduce you now to Dinah Beams? Uh, Dinah is the Programme Coordinator for the Colorado Home Intervention Programme. Beautifully named as CHIP, makes it easy to remember. And that's based in the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. Uh, her responsibilities uh, include coordinating services for families with newly diagnosed deaf children in Colorado, which has a population pretty similar, in fact, to Ireland. Uh, she also is involved in training professionals and in curriculum and de program development. CHIP is probably the best known parent, integrated parent support program uh, in the world. It doesn't mean that it's, you can transport it and bring it everywhere else, 
but it is the best. We're all hoping to learn from it. The UK has learned, and Gwen spent some time there, and with her input in Ireland, is actually bringing some of those elements to us uh, last year, this year, and hopefully next year. Uh, Dinah, by the way, is also an American cowgirl. She owns a ranch in Texas. She's, you know, we call a ranch a farm, by the way, but she's a, basically a real American cowgirl and originally comes from Alabama. So, I'll leave it to Dinah. Thank you so much. It is, it is a joy and a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? Okay. I have a tendency to project loudly. I don't know where I learned that, but I did. And I learned it early on. Um, I'm going to pick up on where Gwen left off and kind of continue this discussion and look at how, as a family, you can be that key member, that driver of the bus, that person who really ensures that you have the supports that you need for your individual family, but also what, how you can contribute to the future and to the system being better. So that's kind of where we're going to go over the next few minutes. And I hope you can all understand my accent from the southern United States. As Miles said, I lived in Alabama, I lived in Texas, I lived in Virginia. Each of those states have their own version of the southern accent, and so I have this colossal mess of a southern accent. So hopefully I will not use terms that you're going, what does she mean by that? <coughs> so parents are the key players in their child's life. You all know that. You probably are wondering why professionals feel that we have to articulate that. You are the decision maker in your child's life. When I arrive in my job, I meet families when their child has just been identified. So much like Wim was talking about what she has learned from families, I have learned a great deal from families over the last 30 years. But when I know when I'm standing on a family's doorstep and I ring the doorbell and they come to open the door with their little six week old, their seven week old, their little bitty one, the fact that I am there, the fact that I am sitting at their kitchen table is generally proof that all is not in their world the way they expected it to be. Grateful for my assistance, for the resources I bring, yes. But would many of the families have been just as happy if they had never met me, and certainly not in this context? Yes. I know that. So that's kind of where I start with these families, with the very, very little ones. And if you can think back to when your child was an infant, or when your child was first identified, where you were in that point in your journey, you can probably, that may resonate with what, with what I just said. I want to start by sharing something from one of the families I worked with. You can find this list on the Hands and Voices website, which is an international parent support organization, which many of you are probably familiar with. This happens to be a mom that I know well. She has three children. Name's Catherine Baldwin. Um, in the U.S., with one of our late night shows, the David Letterman show, he is famous for doing the top ten of whatever. So this is his mom's top ten list. Top ten ways you know you have a toddler who is deaf or hard of hearing. So again, reflect back to that time when your child was a toddler, if they've outgrown that. See if this resonates with you. Number ten. You spend more money on hearing aids, batteries, ear molds, or implant cords than some people spend on their summer vacations. And in the U.S., all of that is funded out of pocket or by private insurance for families. Number nine, your vocabulary includes lovely acronyms, abbreviations, and words. 
such as IFSP, Part C, CCB, CSDB, IDEA, DBs, CHIP, ASL, SEE, Auditory Oral, Auditory Verbal, and more and more and more. So replace the words that are in your context. You have at least five <coughs> stories to start with. Remember when she threw the hearing aid in the fill in the blank. I, one mom called and said, Diane, he took the hearing aid off and he was running to the bathroom and I didn't catch him in time and the hearing aid went down the toilet with a flush. So, another mom called the baby, uh, her little one had fed the hearing aid to the dog. The dog enjoyed the hearing aid very much. <laughs> Number seven, you know exactly how many words or signs your child has in his vocabulary. Okay. Number six, discussing, looking at, and cleaning up earwax are not particularly gross activities to you. <laughs> Number five, in less than a minute you can zero in on the sound of a squealing hearing aid that your toddler has lost in the supermarket, even though we won't talk about how it got lost. Number four, your audiologist, ENT, Early Interventionist, and Health Insurance Claims Office know you better than your mother and hear from you more often. <coughs> Number three, you can answer the questions, what are those in his ears, what is that in his head, in your sleep, and sometimes you do. Number two, you can do your vacuuming when your toddler is still asleep. <laughs> And number one, you never take the ability to communicate, understand, and be understood for granted again. So that was one mom's synopsis, but I think it does resonate with us in this journey. So as I meet with families, what do parents want to know? And again, some of you are past some of these questions. Some of you are revisiting these questions. They have a tendency to recycle at different times in your child's life as your child transitions. Some of the questions that you thought you had answered when they were one may resist <coughs> when they're four, when they're five, when something happens in your life. So I have families ask a lot of questions about hearing aids and amplification and cochlear implants. Parents want to know, will their child's hearing get better? Will their child's hearing get worse? All of those questions that I'm being asked. Which hearing aid is best? I had one dad who wanted to know which, art of, which issue of Consumer Report he could go and get so that he could research which hearing aid is best. Um, bringing the skills that he had to the task at hand. Although, as you all know, it's not quite that way in this world. Questions about communication. What communication system is best for my child? Is that going to change? Is it going to stay the same? Do I need to learn sign language? What is auditory training? If I need to learn sign language, how do I attempt to learn sign language? What are the resources that are available to me? Will my child ever talk? These are all questions that I get asked. Questions about child's social emotional development in their education and these are the questions that tend to stay with you for a long time or recycle. What kind of school is best for my child? Will my child be made fun of in school? Will my child be able to drive, go to college, have the kind of job that I would like my child to have? I'll let you read this quote. So that quote was from the National Agenda, which is basically a deaf education reform um, group in the United States that is working, that's their position statement, and they are working toward um, coming up with further list of criteria and things that need to be implemented across the country to ensure better education for the students birth to 21. So Gwen talked a little bit about team. 
And I wanted just to reflect on that whole teaming, what makes a good team, throw in a couple of other words that are companion words to that, or words that we often use to replace the word team, although they have a slightly different meaning. The words collaboration and the words partnership. They're not all the same, but they are related. So when we look at collaboration, we look at partnership, we look at teaming, they all require levels of trust. So there has to be a trust between the professionals and between the families. It has to go both ways. There needs to be trust between the different members of this team. Partnerships or teaming, though, and the partnership column is going to more closely align to teaming than the collaboration column. Partnership and teaming involves more that sharing that sharing of passion, that sharing of vision, as she talked about the cycling team, there's a common vision there, there's common passion. That's what that partnership, that teaming involves. There's shared value with that partnership or teaming. Collaboration, there may be an agreed upon set of principles. We need to work together to get this done but there doesn't have to be the same level of shared values. <coughs> Partnership or teaming requires you to share your risk, your reward, your vision. Again, thinking of some of the examples that she shared, your decision making. And it requires shared power. And it is not, that does not mean a 50-50 equality, but it is a sharing with the, with the parents, in this case being the key players. Um, this work here is a reflection of a project actually that was done in New Zealand um, that I'm happy to give you the resource for. So what does this collaboration look like and what can a parent do, a family do to impact things? There's a system level, formal. Causes changes. I'll give you a couple of examples where parents took the leadership at the system level in Colorado. Again, reflecting on our health care system, okay, very different from your health care system. In our health care system, hearing aids were not paid for by private insurance. It was an exclusion. Typically in the insurance policies, it would say wigs and hearing aids are excluded. I do not begin to understand how in the insurance company's mind they put those two together, but typically that was the phrase we had. Wigs and hearing aids are excluded. So a group of parents in our state formed with their collaborative body moved forward on getting legislation changed and they asked the professionals to join them. The professionals did not lead in this journey. The parents led in the journey. The parents were the ones who testified before the legislature. The parents and the children, because they showed up with their little ones, were the ones who impacted this legislation and indeed got it through so that hearing aids are now a covered benefit in our state. Huge change for families. Huge change for families. That work was led by parents. It was not led by professionals. So that's an example at the system level of how professionals in a leadership role can move forward, I mean, parents can move forward and make a change. And the professionals can kind of come along on their coattails, so to speak. Um, how do parents impact things at the professional level? So you have all of these different members of your team, and perhaps they're not talking together. Perhaps they're not communicating as they should. What can you do as a parent to try and bring this team together? Some parents that I know have set up different kinds of communication systems within their professionals. They may have a journal that goes back and forth that every professional that comes into their home leaves some notes in that. They may ask the professionals to do a <coughs> joint visit, perhaps the school <coughs> therapist and the teacher of the deaf come to the home together. And even though I'm speaking of this in the context of the home, a lot of these strategies also work with school-aged children in a very real way. Um, they may, the family may ask the professionals, invite the professionals to come to a particular workshop. We had one family in our state who lived in a rural area where the professionals, the school team, had never had a child with a cochlear implant. 
come into their district before. This was the first time. So this family found out about a really good day-long cochlear implant workshop and went to the administrator at their school, made a case for it, got release time for those professionals, and the professionals as a team, not just one professional from the school, but the team of people working with their child, the speech therapist, the, te the classroom teacher, this whole team attended this workshop to gain this knowledge. So that would be another example how a family can really impact those services at the professional level. And then at the family level, helping the professionals in your life stay true to your own priorities. You can tell this is a photo from a history book. <coughs> this is actually my family. So I'm going to give you a few illustrations based on real families. And I'm going to start with my family. My young brother, I am the one on this side, <coughs> my younger sister, my younger brother, my aunt, my mother. My younger brother has a profound hearing loss and mild cerebral palsy. Fifty years ago, children were not identified through newborn hearing screening. And so my brother was identified when he was over three. Not uncommon when you talk to adults of his age group. Every major decision that my family made was impacted because my brother had a profound hearing loss. The state we lived in, the state of Alabama at that time, did not, this, is, this predates legislation around education services. The state we lived in did not have the services needed to support my brother when he entered school. My family moved. There are probably families here that that resonates with, that you have done that or you know families who have moved to get better services. That's what was my parents felt was needed. That was the decision that was made. They left my grandparents behind. It was not an easy decision. I laughed that for generations we were the first group that moved across the Mississippi River. The rest of my relatives to this day really don't understand there's a part of the U.S. that's west of the Mississippi. <laughs> but that being said, that was the decision my parents made. And when I say everything, I mean everything. When it came time for my brother to learn to swim, swimming was difficult for him. My parents felt learning to swim was important. They searched until they found someone who understood how to communicate with him who could teach him privately because he was not doing well in a group class. So when I say every major decision, I mean every major decision in my life. Obviously, I'm still doing this. I was fine as a little one sitting in the speech therapist's office with my toys, okay, and my books. My sister, however, is, she's also very close to my brother, but she approaches life differently. My sister, when she was a teen, I'll go to the next photo of my brother as a teenager. My sister, when she was a teen, presented my parents with a very nice list. It showed her math skills. And she had delineated how much money she had determined they had spent on my brother <laughs> and how much money they had spent on me because I had to have glasses and braces. And she informed them that she was the unfortunate one who did not need glasses, braces, or hearing aids, or therapy. So therefore, she had totaled these two and had averaged them. And in her mind, it was very reasonable as a 15-year-old that they should just write her a check. <laughs> My parents didn't see it quite the same way, but just to let you know, siblings don't always handle things the same way. Um, my brother is married, he has three kids of his own, he has a college degree, he's very successful, kind of going to the end of the story. But um, to let you know how this impacted my family's decisions personally, this also impacted what my family did in terms of their social life, their friends. To this day, my parents have close friends who have children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And again, I'm sure some of you in the room are saying, mm -hmm, we do too. I grew up going on family vacations with other families who had children who were deaf and hard of hearing. Impacted what I do to this day. We, all, my parents also looked at the needs, the gaps in services. My father saw that there were not enough teachers of the deaf. 
in the state at that time. He approached the dean of a university, <coughs> worked with the dean to get a program established for deaf education at that <coughs> university, committed with the dean to be involved in helping to do some fundraising. I graduated from that program. So that was my, my parents' way of showing some leadership again as a family in terms of bettering the system. This is one of the families that I work with, Spanish-speaking family. Fabulous, fabulous mom. The fact that she did not speak English did not impact how she got services for her child. This mom was great at working with the team. I do not speak Spanish. I need to hasten to that. This mom was great at working with the team <laughs> and letting them know what her child needed, what her child did not need, and what that looked like. This mom was very comfortable saying to us, as a team, I really don't need you all coming to my home every week. Thank you very much. That's too much. And she was able to dictate frequency and take control and articulated that very well. This family, this is actually the therapist working with this child. This child started off with a unilateral hearing loss, progressed to bilateral, got bilateral cochlear implants, then ended up with a diagnosis of autism in addition to. Mom is fabulous, and Mom was great about calling me on the phone and when, as he was progressing. Dinah, I'm concerned. I don't think he's hearing as well as he used to. What do we need to do? I would give her some suggestions. She was all over those suggestions. Very aware of what she needed to do and what needed to happen for her son and very well equipped to articulate that. This little guy's mom is a refugee from a Central American country. Um, and they lived in a very rural area. This family was very adept, again, at getting the services they needed, even though they were not readily available in the mountain town where this family lived by the time you drove down the dirt road. But this mom was skilled at letting us know what was needed. She was also skilled at using resources on her own, researching things, getting back with us about what she needed, how we needed to support her effectively. Quote from Michael Jordan, and I think it kind of sums up a lot of what we've been talking about. Talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence win championships. I think what we are all after is the championship, not just one game. And as I had one dad say to me in the parking lot one time after a particularly difficult meeting um, advocating for his son's services, he looked at me and he said, Diane, this is just the first game we'll win. We'll win the championship. This is just the first game. We're not done yet. So I want to leave you with that thought. I hope something of what was said today resonates with you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. That was excellent. I mean, Diana has just reminded us that parenting is a it's contact sport, isn't it? Yeah. It's live, you can't have a script, but you've got to find whatever goes on, what works for your own family. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce Ashling Heffernan. <coughs> Ashling is a speech and language therapy manager and she has worked in the rehabilitation hospital in Dunleary. She's also worked in Australia for a while and has worked on a multidisciplinary team. <coughs> Currently, she's the program manager for clinical, uh, for the clinic, national clinical program in audiology. Now, those of you who've been in the system for a while will understand that audiology is currently going through a huge development program. In fact, audiology and newborn hearing screening are the only two HSE programs in the middle of this recession which have hit every deadline. And that's because they needed to, but it hasn't happened by itself. It's, she, Ashling is also responsible for the rollout of newborn hearing screening. So it's a lot of weight for such young shoulders, but with her program development background, uh, I think we're in very good hands. So I'd like to hand you over 
Ashley, thank you. I might need a minute because the, the PC is oh. just going to die and they It's They used to tell us that computers would replace us, but every time I go past the computer, it's gone asleep or the photocopier is hibernating. So I think people are better at it in the end. It would just be a second. <coughs> Bear with us for a second, apologies about that. Thank <laughs> you. 
apologise to you profusely for that, and also apologise to the speaker. It's, it's an unknown why it's people off when something like this happens. Thanks for your patience. Thanks, everyone. I, I wish I could speak off the top of my head, but I can't. I need my slides, so sorry about the delay. Um, as Niall said, um, I, I'm delighted to be here. And my background is a speech and language therapy manager in the National Rehab Hospital. And I've been seconded on a part time basis since the HSC to do this work. So basically, I've only two or two and a half days available to me per week to do all of this work, and there is quite a lot of it. Just to give you an overview, um, you're probably all aware of the National Audiology Review Group report. Um, and once that was published last year, the HSC decided to make audiology a clinical care program. So you might have heard of some of the other clinical care programs. They're in under Barry White's office in the HSC. There's about 35 plus of them, and they range from everything from acute medicine to diabetes, rheumatology, and it's fantastic that audiology is one of them. And why it's fantastic is the Department of Health and the HSC are prioritizing them. Whatever is recommended through the clinical programs, that's their focus. And Tony O'Brien, who's the new Director General of the HSC, he actually worked in the programs for a long time, so he's really aware of what we're doing. Sorry, so it's so really good. Could you mind just bring the microphone in a little bit? Yep, yeah, no worries. Okay. So you're all probably aware that before the review group published the reports, and probably still now, there's a lot of issues in audiology services. Fragmented, long waiting lists, poor equipment, poor clinical governance. Maybe you've got some good services in some areas and not in others, and you're all very well aware of that. So what are the HSC doing about it? So the National Audiology <coughs> Review Group came together in 2010 and fairly quickly pulled together a report. They reviewed all the services out there and they came up with a list of recommendations. Throughout that whole review, they tried to get as much feedback from service users, from management, from all clinicians, so that they could come up with these well-rounded recommendations. The really important thing is when this, public, when this report was published, it was accepted by the Department of Health and the HSC, which means that they have to follow through on the recommendations, and that, that's the big thing. I'm going to touch on some of the recommendations. You can read them there, but I mean the big, big ticket item is the role out of newborn hearing screening. The next one is that we're using consistent care pathways throughout the country. So if your kitty is born in Galway, they should be having the same service as a kitty who's, who's born in Washburn or Wexford. Acceptable waiting lists, that's, that's the next key thing. A national bone anchor hearing aid service, and some of you might have heard about this. But basically what we have now is ring fence dedicated funding for this program and about half of it is up and running now and the rest will be up and running in early 2013. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. We did recommend that there be a designated national centre for auditory neuropathy spectrum disorders but actually now over the last year we've realised that we need regional teams to be looking at this. And what we're doing is we're coming up with a plan around how to train those regional teams and have them working together. Um, so if I go down to the infrastructure and support, one thing is about having a patient management system for audiology. I know it might sound really silly, but if somebody asks me now, you know, what are the waiting lists down in Cork, I actually cannot tell you, because everything around the country for audiology is paper-based. So every time we get parliamentary questions or you know, questions from the public, we cannot answer. Like We literally have to try and go through all this paper and it can take a few <coughs> months to come up with an answer. You can't manage a service unless you can pull that data quickly. So that's a big thing that we're working on. National procurement system. We actually completed three procurement projects this year. So that's where we're getting you know, good value, we're getting good equipment. So we did it for bone anchor hearing aid program, we did it for the newborn hearing screen, and now we're doing it for hearing aids and equipment. Around patient focus, um, a big thing is around providing good information to, to parents, to families. And this is some of the work actually we'll be doing with deaf here and collaboration groups soon, is that we're looking at pulling all our information together to make sure it's saying the same thing and to be able to give it to you in an easy format. And that's coming in with the next, the next point where we're talking about individual management plans. We're hoping in the future that all the collaboration groups, and that would be 
deaf peer, visiting teachers, HSC and cochlear implant, the cochlear implant team in Beaumont, that we might come up with one pack for you as parents and all information can be put into that pack and it can grow and change as your child develops. So you'll have that one resource which will be really important. Um, some of the other things we're hoping, some areas around the country there are good groups where you have parents and professionals working together around how to develop the hearing services. And what we're hoping to do is establish a network of those throughout the country. And again, very much linking in with deaf hearing and visiting teachers around that. I'll jump down to work for structure. The big thing is around having a unified career structure for audiology. Some of you are probably aware of this, but there's audiologists and there's audiological scientists. And traditionally, audiological scientists are the only uh, people who see children. So that's a huge division in the service. So what we're hoping now is that we'll have one career structure where everyone is called an audiologist and then move up that career structure with their different expertise. But what it means is anyone working in the system as an audiologist would be able to see both adults and children. And that means we can streamline our services and be able to see more people, which is really important. Uh, another thing we're talking about is integration. Again, some of you might be aware there's a big divide between primary care and acute care services, so like hospital services. So what we're trying to do informally at the moment is getting all the teams working together. And where we see it working quite well is around the bone anchor hearing aid program. So while the hospital teams might do the assessments and the kind of surgical follow-up, the community teams now are doing the soft band trials, so we've got good working together. Uh, we definitely want audiologists to be a protected title so that if you go to an audiologist you know that they have a minimum level of qualification um, and you know that's happening with the other professions like speech and language therapy and social work at the moment. And another big thing is around having domestic training in Ireland. We feel to encourage um, ongoing development and research, you really need to have a higher education institute that's running an audiology training program and that can run masters and doctorate programs and things like that. Won't really go down to this, but how is implementation being, uh, how are we approaching it? And I guess, I guess the big thing is around the communication. And at the moment we have a newsletter we have a website within the HSC, so if you look at clinical programs, you'll see there's an audiology website which has the newsletters on it. Um, I also am trying to communicate with as many different groups as I can, so within the health service at the moment, like audiologists, deaf hear, um, the different line managers. What we do want to do next year, though, because we are quite conscious that our implementation group at the moment has been myself, Professor John Bamford, and Brian Murphy, who's in, in primary care. What we do want to do next year is have a broader um, steering group for audiology, and we do want to have a parent representation, a representative on that, and also representative from deaf hear and other organisations. So we are conscious that we need to do that. Um, I think also the big thing is that it, it's the, the quick wins and as you all know if you see progress happening even if it's small it kind of keeps the momentum going and you get goodwill and good morale from people so that's really important. This is the, most, this is the best slide I guess, what have we achieved to date? So again considering the current economic climate and you know how bad things are for the HSE, they're going to have a half a billion deficit by the year end. They're also talking about taking another 700 billion out of, or million out of the health services next year. So that could be 1.2 billion they have to try and save in the next year. What's really important is that we've managed to achieve all of this and that Department of Health and HSC are still seeing audiology as a priority. So it's huge. So the big thing, roll out a newborn hearing screening. It's completely rolled out in the south of the country. So that's everywhere from Cork, Kerry, Waterford, Kilkenny, Tipperary. It's now been rolled out in Dublin, Mid Leinster and Dublin North East. So Dublin North East would be Rotunda, Calvin, <coughs> Drogheda. That's all completely done. So Dublin, Mid Leinster is Midlands, Hollis Street and Coombe. That's all done except Hollis Street and Hollis Street is going live at the end of this month. So that means by the time we get to Christmas we have three quarters of the country covered. Now, HSC West is going live next year, so we're very hopeful that by the mid of next year we have full country coverage for newborn hearing screening. So that is massive. 
Next thing we're doing is around the workforce planning. I think what's shocking, or I found shocking, is that there are actually only 72 whole time equivalent audiologists around the country. 72, <laughs> it's crazy. So any workforce planning activity that you do will say that we need an approximate doubling of this workforce. So what we're hoping by the end of next year, we are going to have a national lead in place. So that means we'll have a national expert who will make sure that there's best clinical governance and best practice throughout the country. And he's going to have four assistant leads working with him, one in each region of the HSC. Now, I know some people might say, oh, it's more management of this, that, and the other. These are actually clinicians, and they have to do a minimum of 50% clinical work. So that's going to be a great increase to our workforce. Also, we've sponsored 10 students who did the accelerated MSc in the UK. They're now back in with us, and they're doing a year of clinical training. They're going to be ready for employment in October 2013, and we're going to post for them. So by the end of next year, we'll have 18 additional posts in audiology. So if you look at 72, to get a jump up of an extra 18 is quite a dramatic difference. Uh, we do have a plan for domestic training. We're hoping that there will be an expression of interest out to all the higher education institutes within the next few weeks, actually, to see they all have to pitch and then we'll decide on, on the best one. There really only should be one programme for audiology since it's a small workforce. National Bone Anchored Hearing Aid Program. Now we have six sites for this program. There's the Matter, Temple Street, Crumlin, Cork, Galway and Tullamore. 50% are up and running. So that's Temple Street, Crumlin and Tullamore are now up and running. The other three sites are, will be up and running from January. And the key thing is getting referred into the ENTs on those teams and then you'll be within that program. And we've designated ring fence funding to be able to do 100 procedures per year. Now, the important thing is there is a bit of a backlog, so we'll have a year or two of trying to catch up on that, but then we'll be in a good situation with that programme. Um, big piece of work that we did is a memorandum of understanding between the HSC services, so that would be like audiology and speech and language therapy, between deaf here visiting teachers and the, the cochlear team in Beaumont. And what does that mean? Essentially, we're all very aware, and it touches on, on what Gwen has spoken about in Dina, we're all very aware that we've all been providing our own services in a sort of hit or miss way, not really communicating with each other. So what we've done this year is we've come together, we've learned about each other, and we've agreed that we're going to work together in the future and we're going to work in an integrated way around <coughs> you, the families, the parents, the children. Um, I think the other, the other points there are fine. So in summary, you said we did. I kind of looked back through the National Audiology Review Group report there uh, during the week and I was looking at a lot of the comments that the parents made. Um, and you can see things like, why did it take so long for my child to have his or her hearing loss identified? Well, hopefully with newborn hearing screening, that won't happen anymore. Why are waiting lists so long? The few different ways we're addressing waiting lists, besides having the increase in audiologists and besides the newborn hearing screening program, we're also doing a lot of um, lean efficiency programs around the country. So we're looking at how clinics are run and seeing how can we get more patients or more clients into each clinic. We did a really small project in Dublin Northeast where we looked at one particular type of clinic, now it was for adults, but we did a little bit of streamlining to it where we could get in two extra clients a day per clinic. And when we reviewed three months of data from last year to three months of data this year where we made the changes, there was a 45% increase in, in patient seeing. So we have that potential to do that around the country. So I do think we can start getting these waiting lists under control. Not enough staff, I've talked to you about that, we're addressing that. Poor equipment, we have bought lots of new equipment for audiologists throughout the country, so they're good equipment. Bone anchor hearing aid program, we're tackling that. Service providers not talking to each other, we're beginning to address that. And lack of audiology leadership, we'll have that leadership in place next year. And isn't this what it's all about? I'm putting this up today and I know, like, you know, you, you're very familiar with these pictures. You're the parents of these kind of these kiddies. But this, for me, is the slide that wins hearts and minds when you go in to present to HSC senior management, because this really is what it's all about. 
And if you look at the National Audiology Review Group report, I mean, typically a kiddie was two, two years plus before a hearing loss was identified and managed. And that was for a kiddie who had a severe hearing impairment. They found that kiddies with mild to moderate hearing impairments were five, up to the age of five before it was identified and managed. So really, isn't this what it's all about, that we'll get them at an early stage? Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. As you can see, while we're not working in a perfect world, the, you can see that all the, the major changes we need have been identified and a lot of them are already in place. Can I just share with you before you go to your, your workshops that yesterday, Ashling chaired a, a meeting where there was a, a three-line whip and all of the service providers were in around the table listening to the expertise of, from Gwen and Dinah so that it, w it isn't just yourselves as parents who are be being shown how things can be better. The service providers were in their heads banged together and some deadlines made about working together. So I think that's positive for the future. At this stage, can I just ask you to break very fast into your workshops because this is a focal part of the day. Can I just ask the, these three tables and the middle table there to sit still? And can I ask the rest of the travelers there to go into the room next door? So it's out to the right and right again. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go to the hospital. 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 I'm going